It's the best thing about having a book, actually, is, is that, you know, as a broadcaster, I'm used to talking into a microphone or on CNN and talking to a camera, but now that I have a book, I get to actually travel around the country and talk to actual people. And I'm based here in Atlanta, so I was thrilled that Narcy wanted to invite me for today. Mm. It's so interesting how you set me up because it's a whole different kind of work-life conflict. Um, and work-life conflict is a lot of, of what I write about. See, I've uh, heard you on the radio many, many times. Right. But finally, when I saw you, I, can, I can't. Like putting the name and uh, face and uh, song together. Yeah. It's a different experience well, here I am. I mean, this is. <laughs> yeah, it's weird to see a person that you've only heard, right? It's it's like no, no, that's not what you look like. Sometimes I tell people, no, really, I know I don't look like him. I just sound like him. Because I was on NPR for 10 years. By the way, great thing about NPR is you can dress like that and no one cares because no one sees you. Um, I, what happened was I moved to Atlanta after college and I wanted to break into broadcasting. Um, it was right when the Olympics were going to happen and I just felt in my instincts. I knew that if I came down here I'd find a way to do that. So I showed up at the local public radio station, WABE, during one of those pledge drives and I said, I'll do anything. I'll take out the trash, whatever. Um, and meanwhile, I was selling tickets at night at the punchline just to, to get by. And then after a few months, I found a shot on air and managed to turn that into a career. Weeks later, I was reporting for the network NPR. And then so I, when I was you know, 24, right then, I became an NPR reporter. So it worked out. So I bet on the right city, and, and I, I love it here. So I did that for years. And, and while I was there, I got to cover a lot of interesting things. And a big part of what I've always liked covering is business. So I put Coke and Delta up there just because those are... Uh, two companies that I got to report on a lot, but I also reported on small businesses. And the reason I love it is that this has always fascinated me. When I was young, my mom asked me what I wanted to be. I said a money manager, because I thought at the time that's what I wanted to be. And then I ended up combining that interest with journalism. But I remember my, my grandfather ran a small business. He, he was the one kosher butcher in his little town in Massachusetts. And I remember like, watching him work and seeing how important every, literally every penny was. If he managed to get an extra penny for an item, I would be so excited for him. And I would play with his old broken cash register. So I had this, this understanding very early on of the way that business fed my family and fed my parents and is the reason that I'm able to, I was able to have any opportunities that I did. And that went all the way through high school. I was always fascinated by how businesses work and how they can grow because I knew that that helps everyone I love when that can happen. You see pictures here on the bottom, other places I reported. I reported for a month uh, from Nuremberg, Germany, that's on the bottom left. My wife and I also went to Sydney. I went to Australia for our honeymoon. We spent four months in Australia. I'm very big on like just decide you want to do something and then make it happen. So I knew I wanted to do that. And while I was there, I did a lot of exploration of the economy. In Nuremberg, I was fascinated. How do you build an entire economy after World War II? How do you put away vestiges of the past while still holding on to some of the things that were created then in terms of your economic infrastructure? And then in Sydney, I was watching how were businesses growing in ways that were different from how our businesses grew in Atlanta as a result of our Olympics. So I was all over that. And then I jumped over to CNN, where uh, all of a sudden I started getting this uh, image that, that apparently I was like, the, in a positive way, they would call me like the, the numbers nerd and the, they call me the truth seeker in chief because I heard all these lies all the time coming from politicians and pundits. And they would often, <laughs> shocking, right? <laughs> shocking, no. And, and of course they would say these lies live on the air and then you guys know the system, nobody ever corrects them. And I'm like, wait, but this is basic journalism, is that you don't put falsehoods out there without correcting them. So I started this whole process. I, I created my own career at CNN doing all these fact checks, and it was most of the time about money. And I was digging very far into money questions, what's happening with businesses. And a good example is this. This is me during, um, after the, the American Recovery Act was passed, the giant stimulus, which ultimately, when you combine the interest, is going to add about a trillion dollars to our debt. So when, when that was released, when that was announced, I wanted to know, what are businesses going to do? And what's happening with this money? And is it helping businesses? And, and I was following the money, you know, because if you... <laughs> If you borrow a billion dollars from China to pay workers in Maryland to build roads, then yes, people are getting jobs and isn't that great, but then what are the long-term impacts from having borrowed that money? So anyway, I dug way into this stimulus funding and I spoke with businesses all over the country and I started traveling and talk with businesses. And so all these aspects of the economy have always fascinated me. This is one more I'll just mention here. 
the business clout of grandparents. I look for angles on businesses that no one's talking about. And I saw an article mentioning something called the grandparent economy. So I started digging into those numbers. And I was like, what is the grandparent economy? And it turns out it makes sense that since baby boomers are getting to a certain age and more and more and more people are, are now having grandchildren, uh, they have economic clout. And so the old thinking that, well, you know, the real people to advertise to end at age 54 or depending on you know, what the advertisers are thinking, I started discovering the billions of dollars that grandparents now have and how important that economic clout is. So, I look at all aspects of the economy, and that's always been really important to me. And the reason, big picture, uh, oh, I, I want to mention this too. So this is something called the Global Purpose Summit. And it was something that uh, I did along with a, a company locally. It was amazing. I got to moderate it, and we had their representatives from many of the biggest companies. Coca-Cola was there, General Mills, Newell, Rubbermaid, a whole bunch of major companies. And we talked about how aligning around purpose can be done in a way that builds brand, that builds businesses, that expands jobs. Because everything that I care about, that I know will build a stronger future for me and my children, is um, based on the precept that we have to have a strong economy and that we have to have more and more and more jobs so that there won't be those struggles. So we were talking about aligning around purpose, which is different from corporate giving. It's, it's what is the core purpose of your business when you take a medic of metaphysical approach to the world. And we found that businesses that do a good job of aligning around that triple their revenue. And it makes sense because their employees become better brand ambassadors and they make decisions around that purpose and people start to develop a relationship with them and what they are and what they're all about. And that leads to this big picture thing. I'm going to get real philosophical for just a second and then I'll pull back down to the weeds. Big story of humanity, right? I say the, the positive story of humanity boils down to two things. Number one is that we adapt to survive. We create stuff, that's what we do. So when I'm looking at businesses, and I'm looking at businesses looking for new ways of doing things, it's all about innovation. The existence of this network that we have here today, the fact that we come together with someone's idea, and it makes sense for a lot of reasons. And then we talk about it and you find job leads and you share ideas, that's innovative. When you're looking for new ways to get things done, that is a reflection of the exact same human impulse that led us to create buildings and create tools and all these things. So to me, innovation is the most amazing thing. And that, that excitement to look for new solutions, to look for new ideas is part of what drives me. To me, it makes the most sense in the world. But the other half of the story of humanity is family. And those of us, you know, it's, it's connections with the people you love. And the, those of us who choose to have family um, are having those connections that way. And some people have it through, through friends and various other relationships. But making sure that both can coexist is, to me, the most natural thing in the world. So when I hear people talking about work-life conflict, how it's hard to do both, and it is, um, I always, my thought process is always, well, what's the solution to that? Because how, there's got to be a way that we can do what's most natural, that we can innovate, that we can create great businesses, and also have the time and the connections that we want with our families in ways that are totally natural. And I ran into a situation in which I had to uh, learn about this, and here's why. So these are my uh, three kids. They're about to be nine six and two, so these pictures are a couple years old. And um, with each of my kids, we had major drama at birth, which led me to start exploring these issues that I'm talking about. My oldest had uh, major heart surgery right when he was born. We didn't know he was going to, but at two days we found out he had a heart defect. So they said he's gonna need a bypass operation. So yes, that's horrifying, but it's also beautiful because that's innovation right there. That is looking for solutions. That seems a problem. What's the solution? And he came out of it beautifully. I mean, look at that. There he is. And uh, he grew up perfect. So I had this crash course in being a dad and prioritizing being a dad while also being the sole provider and needing to make sure that I could keep putting the food on the table and needing to do both and wanting to do both as much as possible. Then uh, we were like, okay, second baby will be drama free, but it was the opposite. That's my second kid. He and my wife conspired to skip labor altogether. So she fell to the floor of our bedroom three weeks before due date and stuff started coming out into my hands and I'm on the phone with 911 and then his head comes out and he's not breathing at first and the umbilical cord is wrapped around his neck five times and, and the, the 911 operator was telling me to like use a shoelace to tie off the umbilical cord. I won't get too gross, don't worry. Um, <laughs> but I knew not to. It's amazing how little people of knowledge can matter. I knew not to take that shoelace and tie it off because I knew that 
the baby is, can still be getting oxygen from the umbilical cord. And I knew that because my nephew had had a traumatic birth. Anyway, so this was shocking too. Um, and this was yet another reminder of what mattered most to me. And I was working a ton at the time. I had been working like 14, 15 hour days. Had to. The more I worked, the more I got paid. And so I was starting to have some of that work-life conflict. Um, and then this was so shocking, and when he came out of it, so amazing, and he breathed fine, everything was perfect, that I got a little bit of a reality check. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go on this mission now. I'm gonna find ways to do even better for my family without having to work these crazy 15, 16 hour days. Because I wanna be there for the moments, you know, for that, that story that is life. Um, while also innovating and doing things that matter for society and succeeding in business. So I started talking with other dads about what they were going through. And um, I did a bunch of segments on the air, and these are some of them. And the responses that we got were ridiculously out of proportion huge. This became the number one thing on the newsroom blog. I, I started hearing from other media wanting to interview me about being a dad in the media who was interviewing other dads. <laughs> Because no one was doing this, and what I learned was that no one was having these real conversations with men who aren't stereotypes about how are you doing it, how, how are you having your life at home, and having all the success at work, and how do you balance it, and what are you struggling with? And I started to learn facts that really worried me about business and the economy, because I, I study all these trends. So I started to find out that um, many caregivers were dropping out of work altogether because they couldn't find any balance, and then they were unemployed, or um, getting fired when they took off a little bit of time because they needed that time and, and their businesses couldn't find a way to make that work for them. And so I started to see, look at, at national studies and global studies and see, well, what can be done to help men and women to make sure that we can have lives in both places so that the economy doesn't suffer, so that the business doesn't suffer. And um, the more I dealt with real numbers, the more I found that there were all these lies out there that were actually hurting businesses because they didn't know these things. And this is a, a column I did. This some guy wrote a column saying that those of us who go to jobs every day and work um, are just automatically bad parents, that uh, we, uh, we, when we get home we don't do anything, that we don't care about our kids, that we just care about going to work every day. Meanwhile, working hard to put food on the table is parenting. That's a critical part of parenting and it was just incredible disrespect. So I found all these lies out there and I, I wanted to start putting the facts out there and learn more and more about them. Uh, and these are some of the things that I learned about dads as modern employees and why there is this struggle going on and why men aren't talking about it in the workplace, but why we are so affected by it and how it's hurting businesses. So these are some examples that modern dads more than, it's virtually all, it's, it's well up into the 90s, the percentage wise. I spend three hours each workday caring for our kids. Um, studies find that we're suffering from work-life conflict as much as or more than women. And that one really struck me because I started following the trends between work-life conflicts at businesses and profits at businesses. Work-life conflict hurts because it makes people less productive and um, less happy and certainly less good brand ambassadors. And then um, I found that people were leaving jobs for better work-life balance, even at a salary reduction. And I started interviewing guys some were taking ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars off of their salary to work places where they felt they had better balance, and they ultimately value family time over money. So this was all interesting to me statistically, and I wanted to know how it plays out for businesses and how it how it can work. And what I started to find, and I have this is by the way the most footnoted book you're ever going to see. I don't want you to take my word for anything. All right, I you know I did what I did at CNN. I started going through and, and seeing like what are all the lies, and so I have pages and pages and pages and pages of footnotes. And, and I want you guys to see this stuff because I started studying the few businesses that were making decisions that helped build more jobs and embrace their employees as whole people to make sure that they can they can have their family time as needed, but be more productive than they were before they had that. And this was some of the, uh, of the results that come from increased work-life conflict, because you get less productivity, worker loyalty goes down, people leave far more often. Um, worker satisfaction goes down, corporate pride goes down, which plays out in all sorts of things. When uh, people like me in the media start in doing interviews, even like off the record anonymously with employees, you start to get more and more negative remarks, you see more and more negative remarks online, and employee retention goes down. Uh, but the good news was, um, that there are ways to save it. When employees leave, this one gets really ugly. There's different numbers all over the place, but some of these employees that I found who were leaving their businesses were uh, leading to major costs at those businesses and different studies, but the best one from Society for Human Resource Management found that when you lose an employee, the cost can be between 90% and 200% of 
an annual salary. And I started looking at those figures and it made sense because when people were dropping out of the workforce for these reasons, what's happening is you have to get your headhunters involved and you spend all this time looking for new people. And many of you inside that agency have to give up what you're already doing to do that person's work in the meantime. And after all that, when you fly someone in and move their family and get them all situated and put them through training, all you have is someone who is less good than the person you lost because they're brand new. So when you look at these costs, I was like, okay, so I understand how businesses are, are suffering. And one of the reasons that that seemed clear to me was I was doing interviews with some of these big companies out there. Sheryl Sandberg at Facebook talked to me. I started to find that a lot of the big companies that during the time that I've been at CNN, these companies, some of them didn't exist. Like Facebook was started after I started at CNN, which is incredible to think. And it went on to become this bazillion dollar business. So how did it go from not existing to becoming massive? And I started talking with the employees there and I started talking with the leaders there. And they started showing me these direct relationships between programs and policies that help people in the workplace still have their lives at home to make sure that you have some flexibility, not total flexibility all the time, have some flexibility, have some family leave when your kid is born. And they showed me how that attracts and retains the highest quality employees. All these businesses are, are run by shrewd business people. And they are not doing some sort of charitable corporate giving by having more and more options for people to have lives at home and at work. They expect a lot from their employees. But the more that they offer these things, the better they do. Now, this is the backdrop for what happened with me. I had been learning all this and writing about it at CNN when all of a sudden I found myself in a weird situation. My daughter was born. Um, before she was born, my, when my wife was pregnant, we looked at a lot of stuff going on in our home and we realized that I would be needed at home for a while after she was born. I had been working at CNN for many years and we had this very strange policy under which, and you don't have to follow me on this, it's so strange. Um, it sounds really generous. Anyone could get 10 paid weeks off after having a baby, except a man who impregnated his own wife. So, I know. So, if I give up my kid for adoption and some other guy adopted her, he could get 10 paid weeks. If we used a surrogate, I could get 10 paid weeks. If I had a same-sex a same -sex domestic partner, he adopted a baby, but I did not adopt the baby. I could still get 10 paid weeks to take care of his baby. But I, the real me, couldn't. And there were very serious medical things going on. And it was scary. And there would get, I, I went to them totally in secret. I was like, I'm sure this is an oversight. I'm, you, of course you didn't want to leave out the possibility that I might be needed to take care of my own child. Um, and they wouldn't give me an answer. Months went by, no answer. Then, yet again, drama. My wife went in for uh, her, ch her checkup, and her symptoms for preeclampsia were extremely scary. Um, like, could be deadly, because preeclampsia can become eclampsia, whatever. It was scary. So they had to induce right away, prematurely. Baby comes out. Fortunately, everything was fine. This baby, even though she was premature, I was not worried about her, because she came out screaming and crying, unlike my baby who came out into my hands, who wasn't making any noise. So um, I was like, she's going to be okay. Um, I'm still messaging work from the hospital room. Nothing. Then 11 days later, I'm home holding my four-pound preemie and um, taking care of my, my very sick wife um, and my two boys. And that's when work says no. That's when they write me, no, you cannot have this, this policy. And what was so twisted for me was that I'm a journalist who had already been covering how good it is for businesses to do this and the reasons why. And I was like, could I at least show you the reasons? Could I, could I, could I show you? Because, because I've been following bottom lines and how they shoot up. When, but um, they were just like, it was just, no. So, um, so the short version there is that I ended up taking legal action um, against the policy. But I was fighting for a better company. And I knew that. And I was, kept trying to explain them to that. And the good news is that they ultimately embraced it. Time Warner ultimately embraced my call and revolutionized their policy. And if you ask them, they will tell you that the major change, I mean, totally different policy, the major change they made is a win-win. They will tell you this. It's a much better deal for the company now. Guys like me could only get two paid weeks. Now we get six paid weeks. Moms, after giving birth, now get more than they used to. And I explain in the book how this happens, how this works, and why it works, and why it builds stronger businesses and stronger economies. And I also talk about the fact that some businesses can't afford to offer paid leave. And, and I'm going to get to that because there are very simple free things that businesses can do to work for, for people like me. That's where this book comes from. That's what this book is all about. After this whole thing happened, I was like, businesses need to know this. And, and when businesses follow these things, they end up having more jobs available. And the entire economy expands instead of shrinking because people aren't dropping out of the workforce. We hear so much about the national debt 
and how we need to cut our spending, which we do. Our federal government is preposterously big. Why would you possibly run a bureaucracy that can't afford itself? But and it's not just about cutting back. It's also about expanding the economy. We need to have a bigger economy. And this is one of the key ways to do it, by making sure that people have the opportunity to be caregivers and to, uh, to, to stay at work. So now the great news about this business, uh, about this situation, is that business groups are inviting me around the country and uh, to have this conversation. And next week, I'm going to be in New Hampshire for this series of events. And I just pulled this one out because it's a good example. The Nashua Chamber of Commerce in New Hampshire, where I'll be next week, they're big on this, big on the book. And right now, all the presidential candidates are swarming all over them because this organization is the voice of businesses in New Hampshire, which is the first in the nation primary. Everybody wants their endorsement. Everybody wants to support them. And um, they are saying, look, Republican, Democrat, this has nothing to do with that. This builds businesses. And it's also a basic family value to make sure that babies can have time with a parent before both parents have to go rushing back to work to put food on the table. So I said at the beginning of this, I'm all about solutions. I want to know what works. I want to know how we can make sure that our businesses grow while we're also making sure that people have family time, that both halves of the story of humanity can coexist. And here's the great news. We have, this is one example of a fantastic solution. We already have a solution in this country that works amazingly well in three states, and businesses have said they love it. We have something called paid family leave in three states, California, New Jersey, and Rhode Island. And the first thing for everyone to understand is that businesses don't pay salaries when someone is off. This is the, where the conversation goes wrong in America. People hear paid family leave, and they think, well, you can't require me as a business to pay my employees when they're off. Of course you can't. My grandfather would have had to pay somebody in pennies. I mean, it, it wouldn't, it's not possible. Most businesses cannot afford that. Here's what's amazing. These programs operate as insurance policies. People who work in these states have a very small deduction out of their paycheck. It's very small. It's like pennies per $100. But it goes into a big enough fund that if someone has a major situation, such as caring for a new child, but also, look at the example I used in the picture there. More and more people are caring for elderly parents or caring for sick, sick spouses, or caring for themselves after an illness, they get paid through that fund. And here is how it's working out. The, the figures are in. I probably can't see that. I've got to change the background on those stats. Um, but in California, where it has, th this is the most successful business policy I've ever seen, and I've studied hundreds of them. Look at these numbers. Businesses in California, uh, they were asked have your, uh, have, uh, for positive or no effect. So has it been neutral or has it been positive? And 91% said it's been either neutral or positive. Way more than half said it's been positive. Productivity, 89%. Turnover, 96%. Morale, 99%. That's almost unheard of to have a policy that's that successful. And the reason is businesses have it well. They don't have to pay you when you're off. They can pay a temp. that You can hold on to the salary altogether and just not spend it at all. And instead of dropping out of the workforce, people take their paid time and then they come back. So you get to hold on to these great employees. And it helps small businesses because right now, yes, the Facebooks and the Googles, they can afford to throw money around like that. Smaller businesses can't afford that. But when you have this, smaller businesses can compete because they can offer it. And by the way, in New Jersey, it's very similar. 18 diverse businesses studied. 12 said it had a positive effect. 6 said it had a neutral effect. Not one said it had a negative effect. Of course it didn't. So it used to be that the, that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce was opposed to these ideas because when it heard about paid family leave, for one example of the things I talk about, um, they were like, well, that's regulation on business. Let's, let's run away from it. You know, one of the executives said they would launch a war against it. Now the chamber's gone totally silent. They're not saying that anymore. And it's, is it tax on the employees? Yes. It's not, it's not an employer tax. It's not an employer tax. It's not an employer tax. And it's very small, and the employees love it too. Now, I will tell you that there's something uh, nationally that's being suggested that's called the Family Act that would create this nationally. And the way that is designed is extremely similar, except it's even, um, even contributions from employers and employees. And it's uh, 20 cents for $100. It comes out, and the maximum is about $250 per employee per year. So no matter what size you are, you, you will never be charged more than that. So, and that's even um, contributions from employers and employees. But a lot of economists will tell you that when it's a contribution from the employer, that ends up being a contribution from the employee anyway, because they might cut back on something else. Um, but either way, what it does is it takes what's already proven to work, really well and allow for some of the suffering to end and you know this is real human suffering that's happening right now there are a lot of families that have babies and and then can't be home with them I'm gonna about to take tons of questions just give me three minutes to, to push through this um, by the way one of the benefits of it is that it helps uh, with the issue of gender equality and this is really important 
This is currently what's going on with gender equality in America. Women enter the labor force at 45%, um, but by the time it gets up to, to CEOs, it's much, 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 much smaller. And when I've looked at why that is, what's causing that, um, the biggest reason is that we still have a lot of these policies, like what I faced, that push men to be the ones to stay at work, push women to stay home, and I talk about these laws and policies and stigmas, the structures of them, men who did take some time off um, for caregiving, and when they came back, they were demoted or fired, because they, the thinking was, that they must be less committed to work, whereas really, they're even more committed. And parents, if you are one, you know we're really good multitaskers, because we have to be. This is an example of an 18 employee business in Boston. And uh, you know what, on your computer, all the colors come out different. All right, whatever. So, um, <laughs> so uh, this is a, a, just an example of a small business in Boston that chose to have this. They are allowing, the, if employees who have been there for two years, they're giving them three months of paid leave. I don't think most small businesses can afford this. But I said to them, why would you do this? And they said, it's easy. It increases our bottom line. They showed me the numbers. What happened after they enacted that policy? They, their turnover decreased tremendously, so they saved all those costs. And they chose to pay people during that time, but if Massachusetts had a public system, they wouldn't have to pay for at least part of it. And what I tell businesses all the time is, mostly like the biggest thing that it's about in this work-life conflict, this whole arena, is goodwill. You know, most places, and if, if a, an employee works for you, and you guys know this, um, and, and you're going to have a kid, and you're going to have some of these conflicts, um, most of the time you can't afford to pay them for like two months or three months to be out of work. But if you say to your employee, or you say to your employer, um, let's start with the say to the employee, we value you. We, we want to hold on to you. We don't want to lose you. We can't afford to pay you for this time while you're off. But what can we do? Maybe we can hold your job for you and hire a temp for a little while, and maybe we can afford to pay you for two weeks. You know, just even having that conversation at all, a lot of employees would start sobbing with tears of joy because, because businesses have been afraid to have these conversations. But the businesses that aren't afraid to have these conversations, that talk with their employees, they say, this is what we're facing. Um, they do better. They get that loyalty. It's this whole idea of goodwill that, that, uh, that helps. That helps. And um, these are some programs for big companies that I found around the country and the results that work. Things like paid family leave, flexible schedules, telecommuting, on-site childcare, transportation options. Um, for companies that can afford these things, the numbers keep going up. This is why Johnson & Johnson just increased what they were offering dads from uh, two weeks to nine weeks. Because they had crunched through all the numbers and they had seen what happens. Goldman Sachs, which is you know, very traditional in its structures, uh, just doubled its time off and vastly increased for moms and for dads. Um, and the reason is that they are finding that uh, these things are facts. That if you adapt to modern life, in which people are trying to have lives in both places, you attract and retain the top employees. You get happier, more satisfied workers. Productivity and profits go up, and uh, your people become better brand ambassadors. And again, please don't take my word for it. Just really, I, I actually asked some of my fellow CNN fact checkers. I paid them. Go through everything in the book. Tear it apart. Find what's wrong with it. Tear my statistics apart. I, wanna, I want you to show me where I go wrong. Go Googling. Go searching. Make me, prove me wrong. And... Um, they didn't, because these things are things that businesses now agree on. And by the way, the Chamber of Commerce now gives its own people paid family leave. Um, so uh, this is a great quote. Uh, the workforce has changed. You have to give the workforce what it wants, or you're going to lose your good, trained, experienced workers who have relationships with your customers and clients. To attract and retain Gen X, now Gen Y, you have to take care of these lifestyle needs. And this is a woman who, who runs an organization. There's one more thing I'll point out, then let's go to questions. This is a picture I took from... Uh, the rooftop of a bar downtown where we had my, um, my book launch party. I love this city. And right now, um, what you see is uh, that there are a lot of benefits to being in Atlanta. You know, and I love, man, I love it here. Who was it? Where's Anthony? He was telling me he wants to come back. Yeah, so hire him because he's stuck in Ohio. He wants to come back here. Yeah, yeah, that was bringing him back. Um, so, when I talk to people, I, I spoke with people, I think, in every state. I, I interviewed, I did 150 hours of interviews for this book um, with people who are working hard and trying to live these, these whole all-in lives. Um, they, where they live is so important to them. The idea that they can live in a place that has a great life for them and their family is so important to them. And that is a tremendous benefit to everyone in this room, whether you're an employer, whether you're someone looking for work, knowing where you want to be. And knowing the benefits to where you are is a huge draw. 
I just spoke in Madison, Wisconsin last week to a big business convention. Is that where you're from? It's beautiful. And all the food is delicious and smothered in dairy products. <laughs> I, when I went there, I was like, I'm not going to make a cheese joke. And then I swear, the first place I got, they said, you have to try our cheese. And then, yes, and cheese curds, yes. And then we went to, um, uh, instead of ice cream, you eat custard. And it's like smothered. It, is, yeah, it was good. But everything you order, I got some fish meal and it came like covered in dairy. I was like, yeah. <laughs> It was so good. Um, but I was telling them the same thing because they love their city. When, when you are looking to attract the best and brightest, you have the opportunity to say, to end with this. So I ask people this often in speeches. I say, what was your first dream? Not your, not your overnight like sleep dream, but your first aspirational dream, the earliest one that you can remember. And when I ask people, the answer is often to be a ballerina or to be a fireman, right? to be an astronaut. But they're wrong. The first dream that we ever had was to be held and to be loved and, and to explore this amazing world, whatever it is, with love in our lives, with connection. That, that's the first dream before the innovative ones took over. But we don't even think about it anymore because it's primal, it's from birth, it's so deeply inside us that we don't even realize it's there. But it is still there. So the best life that we can give ourselves, this isn't about just employees, but the best life that we can give ourselves is one in which we get to live both of these. We get to be innovative, be creative, take part in that amazing story of humanity, build something new in your business, build a new way to do business, build an event like this, build an organization, have the kinds of events you guys were talking about earlier. Everything you were mentioning, where you get together and have these conversations, or whether you're building something at work, that's what innovation is. And have love in your life. When you do that, you are, simple math, all in. There you go. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate it.